Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And the, the jet lag I'm suffering from, I'm happy to be able to identify this afternoon. So um, allow me to, uh, uh, to take you through a few thoughts that Volcafe has on um, uh, sustainability and, and demand. A lot of the topics I'm going to cover have actually been covered in uh, covered quite well by our previous speakers, but since I get to speak last, you'll remember that I said it. Um, I don't want to make an advert for, for my company, but I think it's important you understand who we are and why we're credible to speak on these topics. Uh, Volcafe is an international coffee trader, a green bean trader. Uh, we are operating in 14 origin companies, countries, um, and nine distribution uh, zones. So we have a very wide coverage of the coffee world with our own staff, with our own organization. Um, the type of business we're in is, is, is sourcing beans from the farmer, preparing them with primary processing and origin, uh, and then supplying them with those beans to roasters and, uh, and, uh, and other traders throughout the world. And we're dealing from one bag up to a thousand tons. So the breadth of our business is quite, uh, is quite broad. Uh, so that's enough about us. Um, I'm going to cover two topics. Um, one is the rise of Asia as a demanding uh, uh, region um, and the rise of sustainability. And they're, they're really two very easy topics to address because the, the trends in both of them are so very clear. Um, on, the, on the change in demand, I'm going to cover three basic uh, messages. One is the, a simple message, the demand is rising. Um, and, uh, and a lot of this new demand will be found in Asia. Uh, the second is a, is a message that a lot of this growth will be robuster, but not all of it. Uh, and, and there's a big assumption that a lot of the new demand in Russia, in, in the Far East, and in Brazil is mostly instant and is robuster. However, when we look at the, the facts and the statistics, I'll take it through shortly, uh, we see that there is hope for a rally for the um, And that there's significant room for further growth, will be the third point, um, in the medium and long term. So this is how coffee demand looks. Um, by 2013-14, we're going to be at, at least at 150 million bags of demand. And really, the, the growth is relentless. Um, in the last three years, we've been looking forward one year, we were averaging around three and a half to four million bags a year. And at four million bags a year, that's, and I see a lot of friends from Costa Rica here today, um, that's nearly two and a half times the production of Costa Rica being added to coffee demand every year. Somewhere in the coffee supply chain, we have to find that coffee. <coughs> Half of the, the, the production of Colombia every year in New Japan. So that is a, a message that I think is, is sometimes overlooked. That, that there is this very, very strong growth in demand. Um, and really the challenge is on the producing side to be able to meet that demand. So where is that demand coming from? Well, where it's not coming from the traditional market. So Western Europe, USA, Japan are mature markets. They're not growing or they're flatlining or they're even, in some cases, uh, shrinking slightly. And the USA, with its population growth, always keeps a little bit of, of demand growth. Um, and Japan, with its shrinking population, is, is looking in the other direction. But when we think about where the trends in coffee are, uh, the, the, the weight of the coffee market is, we talk about where sentiment is creating it's in these traditional markets. It's where the big roasters are. It's where the, where the big traders are, where the hedge funds are, where the, the people that take the, the, the temperature of coffee demand are, are located in the blue zones, in the cold zones. Um, and I think that's why coffee demand is sometimes underestimated. Because the real growth is in the south and the east. The, the, the center of, of attention, the weight in the coffee market is moving south to Brazil, to Latin America, on the consumption side and to Asia and Russia. Um, and some of the growth numbers that we see in, in, the, in the developing markets are quite astronomical. Um, and we can debate with the FNC and, uh, and others on the exact numbers, but anywhere between five and 20%. Oftentimes from a, from a lowish base, but still the trend is, is very important. This is adding significant demand to the, uh, to the coffee market. Sometime last year, uh, the, the total quantum of coffee consumed in non-traditional markets, the, the red zone on the map, 
surpassed in total volume the consumption in the developed markets. And that, that, that change in, in weight passed almost without a, without a, a comment. Um, it's going to be very significant because the traditional markets is it's just under a billion people. They, they consume five kilos of coffee per person on average, and they've got that very anemic 1% growth rate. The non-traditional markets have 6.2 billion people waiting to drink coffee. And for us, that's a very exciting prospect. These, these, these people that are learning about coffee culture who are the next generation of coffee drinkers. They're only drinking 0.6 kilo of coffee per head right now. So the room for growth is there. And indeed, the, the actual growth is there at 5% a year. So there's two very different pictures that we can identify in coffee demand. And, and Asia as a share of, of global coffee consumption in 2000 was, was a mere 16%. Um, by 2020, we think we'll get a quarter of total coffee consumption. So not only is it growing fast, that fast growth is being translated into an into a actual decent quantum of consumption. Um, not only is it growing fast, that growth is accelerating. So in the period 2000 to 2010, the overall growth rate was 4% in Asia. But if we take the last half of that period, the growth rate was accelerated to 6.3%. So it's growing fast and it's growing faster. And the rest of the world is, is slowing down uh, marginally, but still it, it, it doesn't reflect the same trend. Uh, I have a, a Costa Rican friend who calls it a sinner's chart. This um, estimates the, the composition of a country's coffee blend. Um, so at the top there, we're looking at a 100% robusta blend, um, and at the bottom, we're looking at a 100% arabica blend. And uh, in, because Costa Rica is a arabica drinking country, the sinners are at the top and, and, the, and the, the saints are at the bottom. And the good news is that South Korea is moving into saintly territory as it slowly changes its blend composition to a more arabica focused blend. Um, and there's other uh, good news at Malaysia, for instance drinking better quality coffee. Um, and if you look at the Western, Western traditional markets, um, North, Central, East Europe, West Mediterranean, USA, you see last year a tick up on the, on the robusta usage as they became very price conscious. And so that, that blend of composition, so the way, the way countries are drinking coffee is changing, and changing quite rapidly in some, some countries. Germany is, for us, well, us in Western Europe, is often put forward as the, the country that drinks uh, uh, solidly the most coffee. Um, so we, if we take German coffee consumption and try and estimate how other countries fare compared to that, and take another commodity like sugar, and this, what this chart does is to, is to uh, index the German consumption level uh, at 100%, and look at how much, in relative terms, the other countries are consuming in coffee and sugar. Now, if we look at Brazil, it's almost there. So the, the, the capacity for further growth in Brazil is either it's going to exceed German per capita consumption, or there's going to be population growth, or some other factor to keep driving that demand. But this would suggest that that demand in Brazil, at least, is probably <coughs> reaching its natural conclusion. And the Brazilians also have a very sweet tooth. Um, if we look at the right-hand side of the chart, it's mostly Asian nations. Traditional tea drinking cultures, emerging economies, uh, places where they didn't previously have disposable income to spend on, on, uh, on, on coffee. Um, and there, there's a huge potential um, for coffee consumption, even compared to sugar. You know, the, the, the room for growth there is quite, quite phenomenal. And we're, we're quite confident that this growth we currently see in, in Asia it's going to accelerate, it's going to become more important for the world economy over the next five to ten years. So just to recap, in the short to medium term, we see that half of all growth in the coffee market is going to be in Asia. So it's, in any coffee company in my position would be crazy not to be focusing on Asia as a, as a, a strategic pillar of growth. Um, a lot of that growth is going to be in Robusta, three-in-one products, uh, calorific products that, that um, tend to be the first point of consumption in a coffee, coffee culture. But not all of it. Some countries are changing to a more Arabica-focused uh, blend. 
and there's a lot of room for further growth, a significant room for further growth. So this trend is not, in our opinion, going to change very quickly. Okay, so moving on to the rise of sustainability. Um, and again, three main points to make. Um, the certification and verification have become the, the practical manifestation of sustainability in the coffee sector. The major roasters are driving this switch in demand. And the farmers are experiencing a benefit from this. I think it, it's obviously very important that farmers see some benefit from this. And we believe they're seeing significant benefits in terms of yield, in terms of revenue, and in terms of the sustainable practices that they, they achieve on their farms. So first of all, where did sustainability come from as an issue in, in the coffee? Um, fair trade and rainforest and, and other um, NGOs have been around since before 2002. But in 2002, Oxfam published a report called Month, and that, I, that, that declared the coffee crisis. A period of low prices was driving farmers out of business, was having severe economic and social consequences, especially in Central America. Farmers couldn't feed their children, they couldn't educate their children. It was a, a crisis of conscience for the coffee industry. Um, and that's really when, when coffee sustainability issues around coffee came to the forefront. What caused that crisis? Um, well, you can see the period of low prices there. In, in uh, early 2002 to 2003, prices were down to 40 cents. At, at that time, I was working in Tanzania. And I remember driving into a village in, in the southern highlands in, in Tanzania, and uh, our land rover was stony. That's how welcome we were in the coffee community. Um, and we clearly had to do something. Um, and the, industry as a whole, I mean the reason behind the crisis was that Vietnam suddenly flooded the market with coffee. But that didn't excuse the rest of the industry. The rest of the industry had to have a response to this because Vietnam is, is entitled to produce coffee. It's a low cost producer. Um, what do we do to protect the rest of the industry from being decimated by the, the cruel realities of supply and demand? And the, uh, the answer that the industry came up with was to adopt sustainability um, and to try and implement sustainable practices to make a more stable and enduring coffee sector. So over the last 10 years, um, I think you can all see the trend that that graph, uh, that the graph shows. There are a lot of eco-labels in the world. So in 25 industry sectors, there's 431 eco-labels. I'm very glad we don't have to deal with all of them. We just have to deal with five or six. Um, and as, as Kate already uh, pointed out, there are some in-sourced schemes, such as Cafe Practices and Espresso AAA. It's an outsourced scheme where you depend on a third party to implement a code of conduct, rainforest or fair trade, um, organic, and you can see that under duress. But the trend is very, very uh, clear. The production of coffee and the sustainable conditions, verified, certified under a code of conduct, is exploded. Um, the amount of coffee actually traded under those conditions, it's a very similar graph, but slightly smaller. So uh, under, and this, as Kate pointed out, correctly, it, it includes double counting. So the actual number of, of, of bags produced under sustainable conditions is probably, if we look at our own supply chains, as, and take that as a benchmark, probably 25 to 30% lower than the total number. But still, 35 million bags of coffee grown under sustainable conditions is, is a significant chunk of the market, and the growth is clear. There's about 15 million bags traded under sustainable conditions, and that's because demand and supply don't always match. Uh, there's timing issues, there's counterparty issues. Perhaps a gourmet buyer wants to buy a coffee that doesn't require a certification so that that production, while it's grown sustainably is certified, it's not sold sustainably certified. And there's other great and other issues there. But 15 million bags, or um, well, 32% of the amount produced, is actually traded. And that figure is again growing 20 to 30% a year. So a very significant trend in the coffee market. Um, what does certification mean? Well, if each code, each scheme has a code of conduct which addresses the three pillars of sustainability in some way, environmental, social, and economic, and each of them has a slightly different emphasis on those pillars, but in essence, they're very similar. Um, there's always some independent verification or certification of that code. Uh, that's, it has to do with credibility. If you don't have that, then it's very difficult to, to make the claim that your coffee is sourced ethically. There's sometimes a promise to the producer 
which could be simply access to market. It normally includes a premium, and it may include uh, the ability to, to, to grow more profit. And a promise to the consumer that there's an end-to-end -end ethical behavior in the supply chain. So there's big, big companies that are very engaged in this. Um, it's part of their core strategy uh, as a brand to, to create durability in the brand, to include sustainability in that strategy. So if we look at the, some of the biggest coffee buyers in the world, Nestle, Kraft, Nacro, Mondelez, uh, uh, Sara Lee, Aragots, Nacro, Aragots, Chivo and Starbucks, they've all got their strategy. And to a certain extent, it's a, it's a combination of strategies, or it's a single strategy. But each one of them has chosen a scheme, or several schemes, and said, that's how we're going to buy coffee. And we're going to leave it up to the Four C Association or the Rainforest Alliance or we're going to do it in-house, but we're going to make sure that certain aspects of our supply chain are taken care of, there's certain reasonably good behavior in the supply chain. And that's really coming from their consumers. In, in the end, it's a derived from that. If their consumers weren't demanding, demanding that, you know, these companies aren't known for their you know, uh, largesse, they're doing it for commercial reasons, and they're doing it to improve their brand. This trend is, again, is an accelerating trend. So each of these roasters have made quite significant promises about how much coffee they will buy uh, by 2015. There seems to be some magic number where everything happens in 2015. Um, and if we look at where they are today, the top 15 roasters are buying about 7.2 million bags of coffee through sustainable schemes. So about half of the total um, amount is, is by the top 15 roasters. So the whole market is 15 million bags that we mentioned earlier. That's today. 2015, um, publicly available information, publicly uh, um, expressed commitments by the large roasters, they'll be producing, they'll be buying 18.3 million bags of coffee, um, which would suggest that the total market will be closer to 30 million bags of sustainable things. So doubling in size by 2015. And that, that's really not far away, we're nearly in 2013 already. That's a huge challenge for us as traders and for everybody else in the supply chain. Because in the end, Nestle and Mondelez don't farm coffee themselves. They don't even buy coffee directly from the farmer in many cases. It's up to the rest of the supply chain to organize in such a way that we can deliver these promises that have been made. That demand is very significant. Um, and in the end, it's our job as, as, as members of the supply chain to step up and make this happen. Um, in terms of where, where that demand is going to come per scheme, um, at the moment, I mean, I mean, most schemes are around about the same, uh, similar sort of size, just over 2 million bags. Um, the 4C has actually just announced its 2012 figures, and that will be 2.5 million bags, so that it joins the club. Um, so each of these schemes has is, is got its own backer, Kraft back Rainforest quite strongly, um, Darig West back Woods, uh, Nestle back the 4C. Starbucks and Green Mountain back their trade. Um, and that's allowed them to build on, on, the, on the guaranteed demand and to create their, their, their place in the market. So by 2015, each of these schemes is going to grow very fast. So we're looking at most of them getting towards 4 million bags if the roosters fulfill on their, on their promises. The really big change is going to be with 4C because there are two companies which are very, very uh, eager to buy 4C coffee, that's Nestle and Mondelez, the uh, previous import crowd. Um, so that's in the 10 million bags, that's a massive step up from where we are now, the 2.5 million bags, and that's only in two years' time. So again, big challenges for the industry, big challenges for the supply chain. I think it's important to mention there are some positive outcomes for the farmer, because uh, we haven't really mentioned that so far. Um, and this is a, a study done by uh, Daniel Fiorucci, actually, a uh, very well known. Um, analyst uh, on sustainable issues, um, and this is from a, a report of a, a field testing of 5,000 farmers over nine countries, and uh, but we were very pleased to see the positive impact of, of sustainability. And the key thing is that prices are, and in, and in the end, that's what attracts farmers to sustainability. They get a bit of a better price. It's not that significant. It's a small premium in most cases. What tends to keep them there is the increase in yield. Because once you've organized the farmers into a supply chain, you're able to deliver training, you're able to deliver best practice, um, and that normally uh, involves an increase in yield. So a 17% increase in yield, a 13% increase in price, a 
35% increase in, in, in revenue. And that's delivered to the bottom line, a 35% increase in, in net income. So there's no significant increase in cost of the messes that we, that we take with this. And then you have all the positive side effects as well. Better food security, better education, better protective use of uh, chemical protection gear, better conservation, um, especially recycling of waste, um, and, uh, and better trade. So in, 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 on the whole, farmers who engage in sustainability and engage in, in certification and verification perceive some benefit. And I think that's very important. If they didn't do that, then this, this whole thing would fall apart very quickly. So just to recap the three, uh, the three areas on sustainability, um, certification and verification have become a practical implementation of sustainability in coffee. Not to say that's the only way that sustainability can be implemented in coffee. There are plenty of examples of social projects apart from the, from the certification scheme. But as a, a mainstream mass impact uh, movement, it's all about certification and verification. The major roasters are really the ones driving this movement. Without them, uh, the, the growth rate would be much smaller. It would be more of a niche, um, niche activity. Um, and the good news is that farmers are experiencing increase in yield, in revenue, and in sustainable practices. So, in general, very good, uh, very good news. So, what's the link? Well, the question that's posed to the coffee sector is how to produce an additional 5 million bags a year. Um, this year we were very lucky, in my opinion. Um, we were wondering who would be the next Vietnam, and it turned out to be Vietnam. Um, and they produced six million bags more than was, was anticipated. Um, happily, we didn't know that before the season. <coughs> we'd have, we'd have, being traders, we would have sold short. Um, there was at least six million bags more demand than we anticipated as well. We anticipated a downturn this year. So that our incompetence balance each other out. Um, that's not probably not going to happen next year. We don't make the same mistakes twice. So where is this additional demand, uh, this additional production coming from? Um, and then we're looking at a, a medium term, here, five to ten years. It, it's a relentless increase in demand. Every year we've got to find this this coffee. And I think one of the, the answers that sustainability presents is that it professionalizes farming systems. Um, that increase in yield is, is almost a byproduct. None of the codes of conduct really address good agricultural practices as part of the code of conduct. And the only one that marginally touches on it is, is us. Um, by creating these defined supply chains, you are able to deliver training much more easily. Um, and when you do, the effect that is possible on you is, 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 is amazing. Um, these are the yields around the world, bags per hectare. So Vietnam, extremely efficient, uh, approaching 40 bags per hectare. Uh, a similar product, Brazil Robusta, um, again, a professionalized farming system, only just uh, exceeding 25 bags per hectare. Then uh, we have the more professional Arabica producers, uh, in Brazil and, Hong Kong and Costa Rica, for instance. Um, probably under 20 bags per hectare. But then you've got a real long tail of countries which are not doing so well on yield. And if you can apply sustainable practices, and they are being applied in these countries, combined with yield enhancement programs, then you've got a chance to, to provide more, quali more quality coffee, more quantum of coffee. Um, and places like Ethiopia, Papua New Guinea, Peru, Mexico, under 10 bags per hectare. Not only is that bad news for the coffee consumer, it's bad news for the coffee farmer. Because the lower yield you have, the higher your cost of production. So taking Vietnam as an example, there are plenty of farmers in Vietnam that produce one ton per hectare. Um, not every farmer in Vietnam is, is a fabulous farmer. It's costing them $2,000 a ton to produce that, that coffee. Um, you know, the coffee market at the moment for Robusta is $1,850, $1,900. So they're losing money. If they can produce two tons per hectare, they're making a good margin. And if they can produce three tons per hectare, it's a great business. So that, that sliding scale of, of cost of production, which tends to be presented as a single number for each country, it's actually more of a sliding scale. And if you can get yourself 
for the better yielding end of that scale, you're going to have a much lower cost of production and a much better revenue. And for, for a smallholder farmer, that's incredibly significant. And if we can, if we can push in that direction, we solve two problems. We solve the problem of where the next generation of coffee is coming from, and we solve the problem of raw income. So it's, it, I think it's an it's a issue which the coffee sector is addressing very seriously. Uh, most companies that I know of have some sort of yield enhancement programs in place, um, and, and we're no exception to that. Um, and we'll be pushing this very, very strongly over the next, the next few years, supported by sustainability schemes and supported by the roasters themselves. So thank you very much, and uh, I'll just take questions.